What do you think, Melanie? Should we go and see see where it takes us? And I'll, um... Okay. So, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's great to see you. And uh, the 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 point of this um, the point of this panel really really starts from a very from a very simple observation, and that is that. Africa tends to, Sub-Saharan Africa especially, tends to figure in our field largely through the lens of, uh, of development economics. And um, clearly that's very important and very interesting. But at the same time, it also prevents us from seeing all sorts of other interesting stuff that we will be able to see if we took a slightly broader view of what the history of African economic thought uh, might look like. So there was, um, we made a point of choosing to study the economic thought of African non-economists and uh, specifically to reflect, to observe uh, closely what they had to say about things like moral economy and, and inequality, which are clearly two key dimensions that allow to, uh, to observe very closely the making and the unmaking of the boundaries of what the economic is um, to start with. So which was three case studies from uh, 20th century Ghana two case studies if David doesn't show up. And uh, yeah, so we'll take it from there. We'll have the papers in a, in a row and then we'll, uh, we'll, take it, we'll take it from there. And then if David comes at two, then Melanie, you and I will, will use this hour. And if David comes, uh, comes at two, he can have his 20 minutes presentation and 10 minutes questions uh, at the end. Uh, should I go first? You want to go first, Melanie? I don't know. Should I go as we do the program? You can or? go first, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Let's see how this goes. Okay, all right. So I want to tell you about a very interesting uh, Ghanaian intellectual, J.B. Um, Dankwa. Basically, the story of Ghanaian politics is told as, a, as the story of two traditions. One, uh, more socialist, pan-Africanist, and anti-imperialist, which is associated with the life and work of Kwame Nkrumah. And this is a, an intellectual tradition that they received lots of attention and lots of study, even beyond uh, certainly Ghanaian, but also African studies. The second tradition instead is the so-called liberal one. Uh, and this is really something that has remained more confined uh, to, to historians of Ghana, but that hasn't, hasn't had as much uh, impact as it could have had uh, beyond that. And so today I want to tell you about Joseph Boachie Dankwa, who's the father of, of liberalism um, in Ghana. So what is liberal about Ghanaian liberalism? Well, there's three key issues here, an emphasis on the rule of law, an emphasis on individualism, and an emphasis on praising free enterprise, free market, and capitalism broadly defined. Uh, uh, one of the things that I like to do is actually to complicate uh, this story, to show how this is certainly for Dankwa, even though he's considered the father of this form of, uh, of thinking in the Ghanaian context, um, a severe misrepresent misrepresentation. And uh, economic inequality represents a, a beautiful, a powerful entry point to think about this, as I'll tell you in a minute. So who was Joseph Boachie Dankwa? He was the son of the royal drummer of the court of Achema Buakwa, one of the Akan kingdoms in, uh, in Southern Ghana. Uh, his father was one of the first people in the area to convert to Christianity. So in a sense, Dankwa's intellectual, um, intellectual work is an attempt to combine the best elements of Christianity with those of the Achema Buakwa tradition with different forms of, uh, of Western thinking, of liberalism and so on and so forth. Um, he was one of the first, if not the first West African to obtain a PhD in philosophy. He was the winner of the John Stuart Mill Scholarship in the Philosophy of Mind and Logic. Then he returned to Ghana where he became very involved in uh, politics. He was very involved in the, in the anti-colonial struggle. He was arrested by the British with Kwame Nkrumah and others. But then after Kwame Nkrumah came to power, he became the main member of the opposition. And eventually he paid uh, dearly for that by dying in, uh, in prison. So why economic inequality and how do I understand it? Uh, it seems to me that uh, so much discussion on economic inequality has really been about, about measurement, about measuring income and wealth over time 
And uh, in a sense, intellectual histories of economic inequality have reflected uh, this. I think of that uh, special issue of history of political economy. We think about historicizing, uh, what does it mean to think about economic inequality? We think of different ways of measuring it, of visualizing it, of quantifying it. We think of Gini, we think of uh, all these kinds of things. I would like to take a step back and actually take a broader view of the semantic sphere of economic inequality. As something that, uh, well, as we know from classical political economy, but also more recently from, uh, from Tony, as something that has to do with class, with the moral and customary issues underpinning the debate about who owns different factors of production and what are the mutual obligations of different classes of society towards, um, towards each other. But also in reference to what uh, Michael Thompson in a beautiful book on intellectual history of economic inequality in the US, Define the politics of inequality. In the sense, this starts from the very strong assumption that this, the debate, that the semantic sphere of economic inequality is inevitably about community building. It's about asking profound questions on the nature of the meaningful and harmonious um, community. So what I'm going to do in the case of Danqua is, uh, well, to rescue his thought on a variety of issues, to think precisely of the intersection of these things and land, discussions of land tenure and the nature of land versus other factors of production sits um, at the center of, um, of, of, of this uh, in many ways. And I'm going to show you that perhaps this characterization of Danqua as a free market individualist is very much uh, an anachronistic uh, misconception. Um, that doesn't really that doesn't really apply to many of the interesting things uh, that he said. This leads not only in the context of Ghana to perhaps a more general attempt to overcome this dichotomous uh, this dichotomous story. Hi, David. You can go. You can go next as soon as I'm done. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank uh, you very much. To, all right. It's an attempt to go beyond this dichotomous understanding of Ghanaian politics, and but also more importantly, to think of uh, the concept of liberalism and socialism, not something that is necessarily mutually exclusive, but as a broader series of tropes that can be appealed to and mobilized in specific historical contexts. The, 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 last, the last aspect that I want to emphasize is how we look at the semantic sphere of economic inequality in this way. Um, is something that allows the articulation of what uh, Francois Artaud called uh, regimes of historicity. So it's not just the time of the economist, the homogeneous time through which we measure inequality. It's about the construction of broader narratives that tie together in different ways, the past, the present, and the future. So if we have to look for economic inequality, and I'd like to thank David for helping me to, to think about this and to, to sort it out. We've had many conversations about this. Where do we start? Given that Danqua was so keen to rescue the intellectual, the cultural, the linguistic um, heritage of the, of the Akan people, then an obvious place to start is to see, so how was how the concept of economic inequality uh, translated or conceived in, 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 in Akan? Uh, in Chi. Uh, and the answer to that is the expression pe 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 your name. Uh, David, apologies for the pronunciation. I'm going <laughs> to correct you on this as much as you want. Which implies the denial of exactitude, the denial of, uh, of equality. So perhaps this expression doesn't take us very far. Maybe it's more fruitful to think of how notions of poverty, or hia, and wealth, or gold, sika, have circulated. And uh, if we start focusing on this, the first thing that emerged is that the Akan share with, uh, with other African cultures, an idea of poverty that really is related to relative poverty. So it's less about how much you own and more about your place in society, broadly speaking. And there's a series of examples of other um, languages and some proverbs that actually um, uh, resonate with this idea that poverty is something to do with, with loneliness, with being disconnected from the community. So what about the, so Proverbs clearly represent a fantastic source to, to historicize different notions of economic uh, inequality. And the first thing that I wanted to do was to look, given the extensive corpus of Proverbs, of Akan Proverbs on poverty and wealth, which were the ones that Danqua actually used and appealed to. And he wrote in, in the 40s, this fantastic book on the, on the Akan idea, the Akan conception of God. And it's interesting how in, uh, in Akan proverbs, you find many proverbs that emphasize the virtues of redistribution and, uh, and the obligations of the rich towards the poor, but also many others that actually condemn poverty or present very 
factual statements about uh, about the um, about the place of poor people in society. And it's interesting to look how Dankwa purposely chose in the appendix of this book only the proverbs that emphasize the virtue and the ethics of distribution, those that I underlined, for example, um, rather the poverty, the poor relative never lacks a bed, and so on and so forth, rather than those that actually condemn, condemn poverty. He also went as far as to say, though, at the same time, and this is a very interesting uh, conceptual operation in a now largely forgotten um, pamphlet from the, from the early 50s, that the poor is non-existent in Akan communities. The poor as a class and not as individuals. I could give you a list of 61 proverbs deal with poverty and the poor man, but I have not come across a single proverb in which the expression ayafo, which is the, the poor people as a class, rather than hoyani, which is the, the single uh, poor person, appear. So this very interesting thing of Dankwa presenting uh, traditional, so let me use this expression, even though I don't like it very much, Akan society is one in which Poverty is an individual problem, but not uh, a class one, and certainly one that is largely mitigated by this uh, virtuous uh, life and, and virtuous values of, uh, of a community. This opens up, uh, I think, the, um, the, the discussion as to the mobilization of broader concept and seeing how before claiming, as it did in the 60s, that the African is at heart a liberal, clearly as a polemic against different forms of African socialism, Dankwa was very keen to describe pre-colonial institutions as socialist or even as communist. Um, so we see the kind of the evolving uh, semantic value attached to notions of socialism and communism. And we see the shift from something that refers to, to the absence of private property rights. If you allow me, to, it's more complicated than that, but let, let's, let's keep it at that for now. The absence of private property is the embodiment of this communist, but also communitarian, perhaps is a better expression, um, ethos, to socialism as a political platform for contesting colonial rule, to their rejection in the, in the 60s, in the late 50s and 60s. And that's, I think, the first point, that Tanqua embraced this explicitly anti-socialist and anti-communist rhetoric only later in his life. And some of the most important and interesting things that he wrote were actually much closer to a form of communitarian thinking that mobilized very freely and very often concepts of both socialism and communism. So land is certainly something that sits at the center of, 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 this, um, of this discussion. Again, the tale of Ghanaian capitalism or capital accumulation is certainly tied with the story of cocoa farming, which represented the biggest uh, export of the country in the formative decades in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And therefore, we might have expected someone like Dankwa to side from the very beginning with the entrepreneurship that is associated with the Ghanaian cocoa farmers, right? Kind of, it's an indigenous economic miracle. Think about the work of uh, I think work about the work of Polly Hill and all these others. We saw Ghanaian cocoa farmers as this, uh, as this rural capitalist. Instead, what we see is that Dankwa, especially at the beginning, was quite unhappy about the fact that because of cocoa farming, the land was actually being subject to increasing um, sales. And now this is interesting because when we think about economic inequality, it's not just about who owns the different factors of production. And so what stands uh, out when it comes to land is that land belongs to the community, which is vested in the stool, um, and so on and so forth. So there is also qualitative inequality between land and other factors of production. Therefore, what does it mean to have a wealth or to have a claim over, over these things? And this, uh, this citation here is particularly uh, important when it comes to that. When I speak about the, the, mis the dismemberment of Madera as Chimabuakwa, as he puts it. In the 1930s, he wrote this pamphlet, again, largely forgotten, right? And, and which sits very uncomfortable, very uncomfortably with characterization of Dankwa as an individualistic liberal. Why? A, because he cites approvingly Hitler's Mein Kampf uh, as an attempt to kind of crush, to see individualism as part of the problem and not the solution. Individual liberty is a chimera. What should take priority is the community, is the sovereignty, which is vested in land. At the same time, there is a broader critique of the political economy of inequality brought by 
uh, the, the colonial regime and the, and the way in which it, it under, in, in, in unfolded in the, in the cocoa industry. Uh, the context is quite specific here. It's that of a cocoa holdup in which the cocoa farmers refused to sell the produce, but also boycotted the import of foreign goods, especially of British goods. So Dankwa placed this as part of a larger struggle. The present struggle for the control of the cocoa trade is about capital and labor, the owner of the machinery and the owner of the soil, and so on and so forth. And I thought that this is as close to a Marxist, if I may this expression, language that Dankwa ever came. It's something that appears in this pamphlet and then it kind of uh, uh, shies away. But it's kind of interesting, again, to reflect on the flexibility of the intellectual reference points and the ways in which they're mobilized at specific points of, um, of, of, of Ghanaian history by, by Tanqua. Uh, what time did I start talking, Melanie? Did, did, did you have any idea? I forgot to check the time. I should have kept time on myself for us, one of you guys to do it, but uh, I think I started. I didn't check it, but I think you have at least five more minutes, I think. Okay, that's right. Something talking. like that. Okay, all right, thanks. So uh, what is another site to think about how land shapes the discussion of uh, not so much, not only economic inequality, but actually the kind of institutions that the colony and the post-colony needs. Uh, another entry point is the debate on the national bank and the, the, the possibility to institute a national bank, something that Dan Kua was very fond of and he thought it would be very important to actually expand the circles of credit and therefore really promote the economic development um, of the Gold Coast. What is interesting about this is Dankwa characterizes the British opposition. This is again where temporality and historicity comes hand in hand, because this is an entry point to reflect on how Dankwa wanted to de-link the, the, the Akan word and Ghana in particular from uh, the kind of stadial histories of development through which the West had understood much of Africa. We see this in some of his work on the origins of Akan culture, but this attempt at delinking is something that trickles down even in very specific debates, like the one on the, on the possibility to institute a national bank. So the British say, oh, it's too late to have a national bank for Ghana because we got uh, Barclays and whatever, they, they do all that is needed. It's too early because you guys lack the necessary political and the necessary economic maturity, or it doesn't matter because your institutions are beyond reform and whatever is in place will work fine. So even the way in which the British presented their opposition to the possibility of building a national bank was grounded in this kind of temporal narrative about where the Gold Coast set within this uh, stadial, stadial history. And what is fascinating is how is this very ironic passage in which Dankwa uh, debunks the stages of history idea that uh, that are that underpinned so much early development economics. It was shortly before um, Rosto, but we get a sense that is the intellectual atmosphere prevailing at the time. And he says, "I do not quite know what is meant by the present stage of economic development." And obviously, that there is a pun here, whether it's an Elizabethan stage or a Bernard Shaw stage, whether it's a conservative or a socialist stage. But the time has got for us to cut straight to the vicious circle and can be no doubt that the time is now. And even though it might, might seem disconnected, once again, it brings it back to the issue of land and how uh, the legacy of land tenure should not constrain too much the possibilities in the realm of political imagination as to what the institutional landscape of this country should be. And so the argument that because most of our lands are held on a communal tenure, national bank is out of the question, I believe that the best answer is that capitalist form of security is not the only pebble on the beach. So clearly the point here, and I'd like to, to conclude here, clearly shows that uh, Dankwa was not the free market individualist capitalist that including some of his political heirs in the, in the MPP want him to be. There was, there was much more uh, to it. And uh, the discussion of land and the semantic sphere of economic inequality, even defined in, in broader terms, um, is something that allowed a rearticulation of the relationship between um, the past and what could be learned from the specificities of Akan institutions for the future, but also broader historical narratives in the attempt to detach the experience of the Akan people and the Akan culture while promoting a harmonious uh, synergy uh, of uh, foreign and uh, and local and local institutions. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And uh, 
So, David, you can go next uh, if you want. Uh, you have 20 minutes, so we do the papers in a row, and then we have questions um, at the end. Thank you very much. Try to share your screen, David, see if it works. Great. So our next speaker is David Damtar, the University of, of Oxford. Thank you, David. You need to mute yourself. You need to mute yourself. You're still muted. Sorry, um, is my screen okay now? You can see it. If you can make it full screen, it would be better if you go on slideshow, or otherwise it's fine like this. We can see it, I guess. Yes, I, I think I've tried to put it on slideshow. Is it on slideshow now? No. No? Oh. I do oh, have it on. It's fine. I mean, we can see it. You can also speak like this if that's uh, if that's fine. Oh, if you. Probably I could on share and reshare again. If okay, you can also try that, yeah. I'm wondering, I've personally tried to do this um, this morning and I was facing this challenge. I couldn't resolve it before. Okay, no problem. The event. Oh. Uh, no, it's like he used to be. It's fine. We we can see it. We can just uh, we can just go there. Don't worry. It's all very clear. Oh. Wonder, and in fact, it becomes difficult to navigate it or to navigate through those various slides. I don't know. Okay, try try to change the slide. See if we see the change. Do you yeah, see it? That's perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Don't worry. You can go. Okay. All right. So, um. My presentation is on moral economy, um, of course, in context, probably not the way um, most of us are quite familiar with in terms of um, the pioneering work of e the likes of E.P. Thompson. That in terms of contesting mineral wealth in Asante, I'm just trying to use this as um, a highlight, but not necessarily an aspect of the current slide. It's not an aspect that I'm going to deal with, but I'm just trying to um, Drum home the idea that um, contested wealth in Asante um, has a very long history and at present is still in existence. For example, in the context of the attempt of the state to um, manage artisanal mining and to um, ensure um, environmental safety and to reduce the kind of pollution and destruction that illegal mining, especially, is causing to the environment, including. Uh, water bodies and forests. But um, today I'm, I'm just going to make this point and then I am rather interested in history, the ways in which various actors have contested mineral wealth and probably look at this in terms of moral economy uh, within Asante um, extractive spheres. So my presentation today is going to look at four key case studies, one in the pre-colonial period and um, the rest dating to the late colonial and um, early post-colonial period. I believe that um, from Gerardo's presentation, we've um, at least gotten to know what, um, or if we were not familiar with Sika, which is 
um, literally translated as money in um, Asante or in Akan language also mean gold. Um, probably we have heard that from Dorado's presentation. Sorry that I couldn't join quite early enough. But there are other um, words that probably I might be mentioning, something like Akonkofu, which is a term that was designated for traders in Asante or in the Akan um, regions, particularly those who travel to the coastal parts to um, involve themselves in the Euro-African business activities in the coast by the 19th and 20th century. I will also be making references to Nkwankwa, um, which is a term that refers to young men. And they are young men not by their age, but rather as a result of um, their sociocultural position. Um, and these are free commoners and they are non-office holders. They don't hold royal positions in the Asante um, society or the social ranking of people as we could compare to maybe in Western society where we have lower class, middle class and upper class. And these individuals in fact could become nobles, could as a result of um, their wealth. And I may also be making references to um, taxation, for example, and it comes in two forms. And one is debt duties, which is simply called awinadie, which is usually levied on um, individuals um, acquired movable properties. And there is also a Yibwadir, which is an inheritance tax, which by the um, late 19th century um, gained so much traction as it shaped the ways in which people contested wealth in general, and even to some extent, mineral wealth. And nobles basically are called Abrimpong, probably um, Gerardo might have mentioned that as well. But to um, go back into some sort of literature, um, Currently doubling as an administrative region in Ghana, Asante remains a consistently mined region in Ghana as its contribution to gold production never abated since the inception of industrialized mining in the 1890s. Meanwhile, the extraction and trade of gold in the region further dates a few more centuries back. In this kingdom, the conception of the value of gold known in the Akan language as Sika, as I already mentioned, and ideas of a mineral wealth distribution and redistribution cut across economic, social, political, and cultural thoughts and predates British formal colonization in the 1900s. These concepts and ideas have evolved in response to various encounters and changes. Central to these is the hegemonic principles and changing responses that shape the extent to which individuals, institutions, and communities seeking benefit from mineral wealth are able to, and also do contest existing forms of distribution Commenting about 19th century Asante or Akan traders named as Akonkofu, Kwame Ahim notes that Asante kings discouraged trading among such commoners for fear that they would challenge the hereditary ruling ranks of society or trade off the security of the state in exchange for their personal mercantile interest. To make such and other related state mechanisms work, Tom Makarski demonstrates that the Asante state deployed coercive power although without limitations. Manuel Osafo similarly connects this um, state's capacity to control um, with what he describes as the Asante social contract. And this social contract to some extent embodied the moral economy of pre-colonial Asante. In pre-colonial period, a break of a sort of breach of such contract triggered an intrinsic reaction from the common people and even the ruling ranks alike. My main concern today is, however, to show how such a historical context of Asante may help us to think about the contested wealth in gold mining communities in evolving ways, particularly from the late colonial period to the early post-colonial, thus from the 1940s to the 60s. This paper draws on four key events for historical analysis for moral economy in Asante mining context. The first is a coup in Asante history that toppled the ruler was named Ken Osei Bonsu in 1883, an event in which the redistribution of proceeds of gold was very significant. To move to the mid 20th century, which constitute the main part of my presentation, I draw on a nationwide boycott of mining companies' mill provisions across the Gold Coast, which was the previous name for Ghana, happening in, the ninth, in 1947 as my case study. I use the event and its context to illustrate how it resonates with moral economy in Asante mining communities under decolonization. 
My third case will focus on the push for an eventual abdication of one king um, with the title Adan Sehene, um, who was the paramount ruler uh, within the domain of Obwasi, a very famous gold mining town in Ghana, where the British owned Asante Goldfields Corporation operated from 1897 to 2003. And finally, the phenomenon of gold theft in mid 20th century Asante um, mines is also the last case that I will be dealing with. In fact, diverse and even dissimilar as these cases are, they help us illustrate moral economy in Asante as a bundle of relatable and sometimes contestable and cluster of ideas in changing times and in contribution towards debate about contested wealth in mining communities in Africa. To reflect a bit on moral economy, the likes of Chris Han associates the emergence of the moral economy with a historical context in which a particular normative consensus among certain groups concerning basic entitlements is threatened by an expansion of the market principle. This echoes E.P. Thompson's pioneering use of the moral economy to illustrate how the English crowd contested new inequalities resulting from an emerging political economy that challenged previous just form of redistribution. One of the central issues of the moral economy here, according to E.P. Thompson, is the principle of legitimization, which tends to shape people's ideas about such moral economy. However, the the driving forces of legitimization is neither a monolithic one fits all scenario for all societies, nor a single in indisputable idea. Diverse actors may invoke notions of moral economy in different ways as they seek to create processes which they will, um, as they believe, either contribute to a fairer redistribution or compensate, for example, forms of misappropriation, unfair accumulation, rent seeking and the breakdown of market capital relations. This understanding is important for the historical studies of societies which combine capitalist economies such as the industrial mining in Asante and that of pre-capitalist sociocultural norms in this case. Societal context of this kind, Paul Tiambi Zaleza argues, is an essential part of the um, conceptualization of the moral economy. Zaleza criticized Dunbar Moody's application of E.P. Thompson's model of the moral economy to explore the 1946 black miners strike in South Africa, citing their various um, differences regarding legitimacy and hegemony. Zaleza challenged um, Moody that such a comparison by, um, he challenged such a comparison by pointing out that while the South African case was within an illegitimate or hegemonic um, context, which was a colonial setting, that was not the case for the English um, crowds. Taking into account such contexts by acknowledging the unequal level of engagements helps in understanding the driving forces for how such actors legitimize their actions in moral economic terms. To this extent, pre-colonial Asante's moral economy evolved around justice whereby the state ensured economic, social, political, and cultural balance without excessive exploitation. As I will show later, when the king's taxation system and aggrandizement went beyond the common gold diggers intrinsic scale of consensus, they revolted. In another angle, under colonialism, mine workers agitated against a paternalist company canteen system. Per mining companies and colonial states was the best um, service that could be rendered to the mine workers for um, nutritional benefit without recourse to these workers' sociocultural backgrounds and extended relations within the urban mining settings. I will argue that when the ruling chief in one of the mining areas got involved with controversial deals with a mining company, calls were made for his removal, not necessarily with the institution of chieftaincy which was even struggling to balance with the tide of decolonization. Once again, we will see common people's moral ideas about societal inequalities, not clustering against a monarchical institution like the French Revolution may teach us, but instead focusing on purging and refining such institution, given the complex nature of the group in Asante that constituted the so-called young men or the lower or lower middle class. 
Moral economy therefore serves as a framework for understanding how people challenge unjust actions of chiefs while disentangling them from the chieftaincy institution. Bettina Engels uses the moral economy framework to explain actors' response to structural and institutional changes within mining communities in Burkina Faso as they reach to how they react to the dominance of industrial mining companies and their negative environmental and social impacts. This framework is applied here in examination of the historical, cultural, political, and social attitudes of gold mining communities as Asante by exploring the evolving forms of contestation over the mineral wealth and the plural nature in which moral economy can take in order to encapsulate such diverse yet relatable contestations. I therefore use moral economy in this presentation as an entry point to explore the broader state of changing political economy in Asante covering the pre-colonial, colonial and the early post-colonial period, and their implications on the ideas used in mining community actors to by mining community actors to contest mineral wealth. Here, studying community actors' diverse forms of contestation gives understanding about the political economic realities of the late colonial and the early post-colonial periods and their evolution from the longer historical past. This may encompass what may fall within even beyond their existing and contextual moral economies. Elsewhere, st studies have shown such intersections between broader political economies and local actors' responses, including Markovicki's work about some Polish Highlanders' application of the term kombinavanie as a way of mediating historical ideas with current changes and related hardships, as well as to encapsulate their anti-establishment feelings across periods. Gupta similarly focuses on corrupt practices, which um, is termed brashatar, connecting some communities of North India to the broader state political economy. The term is a bit difficult for me to pronounce. This could be relatable to Kwame Ninsen's study of elite level corruption in Ghana and its roots in the colonial state. Although current study uses moral, this current study uses moral economy approach to present an organic picture of mining communities inhabitants and their ideational grounds towards what may both fit into the corruption narrative, but more importantly also as a response and even in opposition to it. In a more relatable context, Patience Mususa talks about people struggling to get by in post-privatization Zambian copper belt, where some deploy acts of sometimes questionable legality just because they would like to survive. I move on to my um, first case study. It, the first case study relates to a coup that happened in Asante in 1883. And this came at a period when the Asante state had used taxation to refill its treasury after spending a lot on its war machine against the British empire for over 70 years. After suffering a defeat from the British in 1874, Sagan at Worsley War, for example, the Asante capital, Kumasi, was not only burnt down, but also the state suffered an imposition of 50,000 ounces of gold as war indemnity by the British Empire. It was therefore not too unusual for the Asante state to raise its imposition of heavy duties and taxes on movable and immovable wealth, which include the um, Awinyadia and the Ayibwadia I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. With the former, Gold was significant. This was a system in which ordinary persons in the Asante society considered overburdensome in the 1870s and 80s. In part, this increase in state taxations implied that the gold diggers had to produce more for the needs of the state, leading to revolts among which was the gold diggers that plotted a coup against the king in 1883. As Garrett Austin has shown, the plotters were mining in Manson Quanta, a community which lies about 30 kilometers away from the Asante capital of Kumasi. After finding large quantity of gold, they swore an oath in unity that they would not submit to the king because they were not ready to serve him due to the unjust exploitation in terms of taxation. Against courtesy and tradition, Asante that the significant matters deserved the input of elders and chiefs. The conspiracy was hatched in the gold pits and no elders were present as quoted in Garrett Austin. 
This revolt grew in strength as they were able to convince people across the social um, spectrum and other communities and towns in Asante to agitate against the reigning king of Saibonsu. And so the king had to be toppled over because the um, kind of plots that mine workers or gold diggers had plotted underground gained much traction and cut across not just the ordinary or non-office holding individuals, but also even some sub-chiefs bought into this idea and forced the abdication or the removal of the king. While the coup plotters of the late 19th century Asante hinged their action on the unjust customary division of the proceeds of gold within an economically and socially unequal society, the mid 20th century Asante mining context further present cases to examine what could help us understand mining community moral economy and contested world in societies in political transition. Now I move to the second case. From 1947 to 48. So, sorry, David. Opened... Sorry, David. In interior, you've got three minutes left. So... Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. all right. Okay, cool. Okay. So, um, from the 1947 to 48, mining companies actually agreed to introduce a sort of um, canteens or food service for mine workers. But this um, pro project backfired as mine workers that were supposed to benefit from it actually ended up contesting it. And um, one development which I would like to point out is that one uh, mining company official, a director and a British conservative um, parliamentarian described the, um, the, the boycott along the lines that the mine workers were actually suffering and they needed this kind of support. And so it was um, uncalled for for them to have boycotted it. But in fact, there was this cultural situation in these communities where women were arranging sort of verbal contract cooking with these mine workers. And so the boycott happened along the lines that um, the, the mine workers had a more connected relations with women within these mining communities who actually provided even a more stable form of culinary services for them beyond what mining companies may have wanted to provide. And the third case also deals with the forcing of the um, traditional ruler within this immediate vicinity of Obuasi to abdicate because of his sort of um, complicating personal aggrandizement with wealth that was supposed to trickle down to the mining communities from the mining company. And this was done significantly by young men. But the colonial archive do note that these young men did this probably as a result of the um, identifying with the ruling political party or the nationalist political party of Dr. Kram and Pruma at the period, which was the Convention People's Party. But in fact, this kind of agitation and the false abdication of the chief did resonate earlier happenings, which was to some extent even different from the existing political ideologies of the time. And the last one or my last case study is how um, mining communities uh, members, especially mine workers, ideated gold stealing in the mines. And even to the extent of even European mine workers and even officials having ambivalent feeling about that happening and even not sure of how they could quell it up. And over here, some archival records do point out intelligence reports showing that even some European workers consider that um, these mine workers or the African mine workers should not be stung too much, provided that they are caught stealing gold, but they could pay their way out through it. So um, the perspective of these um, mine workers also, and even those who worked around that period, uh, but not necessarily engaging in gold stealing, was that they could realize that there were sort of more collaboration because of the ways in which there were unequal pay gap between European mine workers and that of Africans. And some even associated that with the hazards in the mines as there were this social notion or um, rejection of individuals who even fall sick um, through the, by contracting something like the tuberculosis bacteria and getting um, rejected by families. So over here, we see that several issues were coming at play within these um, cosmopolitan mining communities. But one significant thing is that 
the ways in which community members still ideated their knowledge or understanding about uh, mineral wealth redistribution was not entirely distinct from earlier or even pre-colonial ideas of a research, resource wealth distribution. And when Ghana became politically independent, we see that now as the state, for example, in the first Republican constitution, um, Nkrumah attempted to practice what we could see as a sort of socialism where um, every state functionary now tended to divert the rhetoric away from um, against imperial domain and that of trying to convince mine workers to act in ways that would help to build a sort of socialist system. So to conclude my presentation today, I believe that um, question time would um, probably help me highlight things more um, in detail. But my broader um, um, argument is that um, my discussion has not sought to present a sort of homogeneous mining community moral economy, but as a bundle of relatable and even sometimes contestable, contestable cluster of ideas over changing times. And my last three case studies about the late colonial and early post-colonial periods shows that, that um, there were several historical contingencies that shaped the ways in which mining communities contested wealth. And also in the former periods, some mining community access were either subverting foreign imperial um, economic domain, or at least, as part of the economic inequalities in which they endangered uh, or engendered, they were now trying to uh, navigate it. But in the latter period, we also see that even when there was probably the opportunity for mine workers to have a stronger agency under their own country, now we see that the states had almost assumed the position of the colonial states, now shifting the um, rhetoric to that of enmeshed within a sort of socialist state that was being experimented at the period. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, Melanie, if you go next, you're ready to share your screen? Yes. So our speaker is Melanie lindbergh Guichon from Horus University. Again, butchered the pronunciation there, but take it away. It worked well, no problems there. Uh, let me see. Yes, you should be seeing the screen now. Perfect. Okay. Yes, well, let me first of all thank you, Gerardo, for uh, organizing this panel. Um, and then now we turn to uh, post colonial Ghanaian literature, also as a way to look into uh, ideas of especially inequality. Um, let me first of all say that this is part of my PhD dissertation work. Uh, my dissertation focuses on the intellectual history of global inequality in post-colonial Ghana and looks into different uh, Ghanaian intellectuals since independence in uh, 57 uh, and how they have addressed and engaged with ideas of inequality and uh, especially the idea of an unequal world. Um, in this presentation, uh, I will focus on uh, some of my more recent research, which is actually a case study that I just started. So it's in its very uh, initial phase, um, what I'm sharing with you right now, um, but specifically looking again at ideas in, uh, in three novels written by two Ghanaian uh, writers, Ama Ata Aidu and Aikwe Ama. Um, and I would categorize my work uh, as being within the field of intellectual history, but also on the margins of the history of economic thought. So being part of this, this uh, panel, the purpose of my presentation uh, is to look at writers as, uh, as important thinkers on issues like uh, inequality. So both economic aspects of inequality, but also a lot of other aspects connected to this uh, concept. Yes. Okay. Let me go to the next slide there. Yes. So I have uh, the, the empirical material for my uh, study is three novels, um, two uh, written by Ama and one by Aido. Uh, the first one being um, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, which was Ama's debut novel and was published in 68. 
and it portrays Ghanaian society around uh, the coup against uh, Nkrumah in uh, 66. So just before the coup and uh, right after the coup. And here we follow the main character named The Man, um, or that's what he's called at least, um, who is a poorly paid uh, clerk at the railway office uh, in the town where he lives. Um, then there's the second uh, novel by uh, Ama, which uh, is called Fragments, and which was published in uh, 69. And here we follow a young Ghanaian man, uh, Baku, who um, returns back to Ghana after having studied uh, in the US for a couple of years. And when he returns to uh, Ghana, he is met with these expectations towards him uh, of being a young, successful, and now uh, wealthy returnee, a Bintu that has been abroad, that is new, now uh, has, has returned home with, with wealth from abroad. Um, and this uh, takes place in, in Ghana, but before the coup. Uh, and then the third novel is uh, Ama Ata Aido's first, uh, her debut novel, um, Our Sister Killjoy. And here we, uh, which was published in uh, 77. And here we follow uh, Sissy, uh, who is a young Ghanaian woman on her travels to Europe, especially um, Germany and England. So what, like, like my preliminary research question right now is then, which ideas of inequality do the auth authors activate in the novels? How do they activate them? And with which intentions? Um, yeah, and when I say ideas of inequality here, it's understood broadly as notions which denote either an unequal relationship or an unequal condition. So it's, it's broadly understood, this, these ideas of inequality. Um, I've chosen these two uh, intellectuals or writers because they are really key post-colonial writers uh, in Ghana. Um, then I've picked these three novels uh, in order to zoom in on the early independence era, to be able to, to really contextualize it in that uh, historical moment. So in, in the moment right after independence, uh, with a lot of hope and euphoria, uh, and, and already by the mid 60s, we see this changing um, uh, with so economic decline and a move towards also uh, one party rule uh, by uh, Krom and Krumah uh, and this uh, feeling or yeah feelings of uh, dissolution regarding uh, independence, which is very much portrayed in these three uh, novels. Yeah. So my point of departure for this uh, case study is uh, based on fictionality theory. So. I argue drawing on fictionality, fictionality theory uh, that by writing novels, uh, authors use fictionality, which is signaled an intentional invention to attach meanings, reflections, thoughts, and emotions to the real world. So in that sense, novel, they function like other kinds of speech acts and intellectual uh, interventions by, uh, by taking part in debates about the real world. Um, and again, here specifically, I look at how fictionality then is used by the authors to address specifically uh, issues of inequality in the real world. Um, and engaging with novels in uh, inequality studies is not new. Uh, Thomas Piketty has also done that in, uh, in his uh, books, Capital in the 21st uh, Century and uh, Capital and Ideology. Um, where he, for example, looks at uh, or references Jane Austen and Balzac in his first book. And then uh, in his second, he moves on to include non-European uh, writers as well, such as Carlos Fuentes and uh, Chimamanda Adichie. Um, he, for example, writes that in, um, in, in capital and ideology, literature often constitutes one of the best sources capable of illustrating the transformation of representations of inequality. And while I agree uh, in, in, in that quote, and I also think that's why it's interesting to look at novels and look at literature as sources, uh, I would say that however, while Piketty uses kind of the novels as one could say, ornaments to support his claims. What I propose to do here is then to, to really focus on the novels 
um, and and engage with them fully instead of of using them as as support to to um, to other analytical claims. Yes. Okay, so let's look at these different ideas of inequality that are um, present in the three uh, novels. First of all, broadly speaking, um, there is a tendency of a critique of the post-colonial elite, a critique of their um, neo-colonial mentality, a critique of the modernization project of the early independence period. There is, as I said before, also this focus on uh, dissolution um, and also a strong intellectual heritage by, uh, on both uh, authors from Franz Fanon that is visible in the, in the three uh, novels. Uh, for example, uh, by also again by the critique of the national bourgeoisie, uh, but also drawing on, um, on Fanon's um, writings on uh, the concept of race and racism is also drawn upon um, directly in the, in the novels. But to look at some, some concrete examples of how um, inequality is being um, referenced or pointed at in the novels, one of the uh, one idea that pops out, especially in, um, in Amar's work, is this idea of stilts. When he talks about the, the national inequality within Ghanaian society, there is a mentioning of some being born with stilts while others uh, don't even have crutches to help them or are born laying uh, flat on their back. So there is this uh, notion of, of haves and have nots, um, of uh, different levels of status and power and wealth also presented in, in especially again, Amas novels between uh, some people having lots of things and others uh, not having uh, many things. Um, but these, these more national inequalities or local inequalities are in all of the novels also enveloped in, uh, in more global reaching uh, racial hierarchies. Um, and here again, they both directly uh, reference uh, Fanon's work, especially from Black Skin and White Masks. But, uh, and again, with the critique of the elite, the, the, the powerful black elite wanting to become white. There are references uh, around these lines. Uh, but in general, this sense of uh, a continuation of old racial hierarchies uh, that are global spanning. And then there are mentionings of, um, of the slave trade, slavery, use of words such as enslaving things, um, which, which I see as, I would argue it's, a, it's again a critique of this illusion of the freed slave at independence. Um, this this um, imagery of the freed slave was also used a lot by, um, by Af new African leaders uh, at independence, such as Nkrumah, this idea of at independence, uh, the, the African slave will be freed. And I, and I, I do think that, that the way that, that Amma and Aido are using and referencing uh, either directly the slave trade or using these uh, words relating to slave. I, I, I do see it as a point to, uh, to critique uh, exactly the, this imagery that, that has been used around uh, independence and saying, no, there is still, uh, the, the, the African slave has not been freed. There is still uh, enslavement uh, and, and um, the legacy of, of slavery is still in our societies. Then um, I would argue that uh, the concept of cargo is quite uh, important to, in, uh, to understand uh, the unequal world that um, Ama and Aido are portraying in their novels. Uh, and by cargo, I mean, that I, I, they focus on, it's mentioned in only one of the novels, but it's a, it's, it's a concept that I argue is important uh, or can open up the novels because uh, they all all the three novels uh, focus on this these uneven flows of goods and people and I think that this notion of cargo can um, in, uh, encapsulate that so let's look at the concept of cargo a bit more in depth um, so again in all the three novels we have this idea of of unequal movements uh, around the globe of either goods, culture, and people. 
um, with some examples being, for example, in um, in the beautiful ones are not yet born. Again, as I and as I said, we are following this clerk who is working at the railway uh, office. We are. It's mentioned that this office building was built under colonialism, and it's mentioned how trains are still transporting gold and uh, manganese natural resources uh, to the harbor where they'll be shipped, uh, where European ships are waiting to, to ship off these, uh, these goods. So here we see one kind of, of flow of cargo being represented. Um, in fragments then, uh, again, we, we meet this uh, Bintu uh, Baku who returns back to Ghana. Um, and, and he is met with this expectation by his family, especially that he should bring back foreign goods, the hope of that he would, um, as it says in, in, the, in the novel, turn poverty into sudden wealth, that he would bring some of the wealth of where he's been uh, back with him. So, so here there is an idea of another uh, hope and expectation of a, of a flow of, of goods that would come the other way. Um, and then in our sister uh, Kilroy, the main character Sissy, she uh, when she is in London, especially, she um, observes how the she meets a lot of what she calls poor African migrants. She is also met with the effects of the brain drain of uh, a lot of African intellectuals moving to cities like London uh, and staying there. Um, and with these passages, Ido uh, writes in the novel, um, for the slave, there is nothing at the center but worse slavery. So we again, there is this connection of another kind of flow of uh, this time then migrants or people um, connecting um, the, the old colony with the, with the former metropoles. Yes, okay, I will turn to my last slide. I hope I'm still within time, Gerardo. Good, okay. Yes, so, so what I argue that, that uh, here in my very um, uh, initial phase of, of this study is that Aido and Ama, uh, they are portraying a world that is asymmetrical. It's asymmetrical, uh, because it is both political, uh, racially, economically uneven. Um, they focus, I argue, on, this, uh, on these different understandings of flows of cargo and uneven flows of goods and people connecting this unequal world. Um, and imp most importantly, also pointing at this continuation of these old hierarchies and inequalities. Um, so that critique um, at this point seems, uh, and I'll look further into this uh, uh, later on, but their critique seems to be influenced by uh, dependency theories which were flourishing at the time. So this, of course, idea of uh, continued dependency uh, between center and, and periphery. As an example, also, Ama was actually in contact with uh, Walter Rodney, um, in the 70s and um, also in 69, Ama uh, directly criticized um, Emmanuel Wallerstein for uh, accentuating that this change that Wallerstein uh, mentioned had happened at independence. So again, in, in fact, what we see in the three novels is um, a central critique around again, this, um, this illusion that independence meant a restructuring uh, re, uh, of society and instead uh, pointing towards the continuation of these old, uh, old hierarchies and inequalities. And I think I will stop there. Fantastic, thank you very much, Marilyn. Actually, uh, there's still a few minutes to go. So maybe we can get, we can, we can collect some questions now, if there are any. Um, I've got lots of questions for you both, but this is not the time to let other people go first. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, I was on first. Andres? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much all for your presentations. Uh, I apologize that you have to see me through the mask. <laughs> I mean, I'm in a library at the moment. 
Uh, so my question uh, is from Ger for Gerardo, and it was really interesting to see how land played a role in the way in which uh, inequality was understood and conceptualized by Ghanians uh, in, in the mid, in the, in the interwar period, in the 1930s, 1940s. And uh, my question kind of uh, it comes from a comparative basis. So I'm thinking about Colombia at, at the same point, and there are, of course, similarities, interesting similarities, uh, in sense, for example, of the importance of, uh, of coffee and in connection to importance of coffee grow, of, of cocoa growing in, in, in Ghana. And there was, at this point, a similar figure called Alejandro Lopez, who sort of had this idea that uh, coffee, uh, coffee growing and its institutional representation, the Coffee Growers Association, had this sort of equalizing force. And he sort of conceptualized Colombian problems through the lens of the problems of the coffee growers. So, uh, I was wondering to which, to which extent you find similar narratives coming from, from these individuals, which are, of course, different, difficult to, to situate uh, in the traditional categories. So Alejandro Lopez is, is often also characterized as a, as, a, as a liberal, but of course, I mean, what, but if you look at his background, it's actually very much influenced by managing, managerialism. Uh, he comes from an engineering school, so it's, it's a very difficult figure to, to situate. But again, my question again relates to, to, to this idea that the interest of a simple, of a particular class, and in this case, the class of a small producer sort of represents the problems of, of the country, of the nation, of the colony in this sense. And to what extent there was kind of a belief that uh, kind of a, a benefiting this, a, this, this class would have an equalizing effect. And, and reduce inequalities. Do you, do you find something of the sort? Uh, thank you very much. That, that's a great question. I must say, I've never, I've never read uh, Alejandro Lopez, but I certainly, I certainly should do. Uh, well, my answer is, is more kind of a, a comment to what you said, in the sense that I, I think that what you just said really reinforces um, the idea that studying this kind of thinkers and different notions of, of the relationship between community and different factors of production is incredibly helpful in kind of uh, discarding the rigid ways in which sometimes Western political thought is presented, socialism, liberalism, communism, Marxism, right? You see all this creative reappropriation, circulation, and that's the most um, exciting thing. In the case of, of, um, of Dankwa, it's interesting because cocoa farming provided this, this trope that allowed him to make different arguments at different points of Ghanaian history. So he kind of something that allowed him to articulate his own political position. So he started from this 1920s and 1930s idea that uh, Jim Ebuakwa is communal, socialist, communist, to the fact that cocoa farming actually is something that threatens disorder by, you know, it's almost unnatural because it forces people to sell land to migrants from other communities. So it destroys that kind of, um, overlap between land, community, and different forms of, uh, of, of belonging. Um, to the point, and then it's only later, when actually uh, cocoa farmers are the victims of inequality, but it's a new inequality, which is brought about the excessively interventionist policy of the state. So from that point of view, it's only then that Ghanaian cocoa farmers in Dankwa's account become these entrepreneurs that should be left alone because they know, they know best. So there is not there is not a, a simple uh, a simple thing, but uh, the broader point I would say there's, there's many things I like to tell you, but uh, the broader point is, is precisely about this I think about choosing the right thinkers that you know when we start interrogating uh, indigenous appropriation so of this kind of concept it gets much more exciting and much more interesting right I think of some of the things that. Um, I don't know, uh, Chris Bailey or Sartori and that in the context of Indian political thought, right? What does it mean to us what liberalism is in those, uh, in those contexts and so on and so forth. But anyway, I hope we get a chance to talk, to talk more about this. Thank you so much. Next question is by Maxime, I think. You were the second that I was, uh, saw. Thank you. This is um, a very interesting panel. Um, 
my question is is with the the, the term inequality um so i guess uh, perhaps more for melanie because if i understand correctly the novels you're analyzing were written in english so i guess with gerard though the text you discussed doesn't add the difficulty of translation but um so you reconstruct this object of inequality and it's as you said very fashionable to talk about inequalities now yeah. and in the case of pkt though even if it's sort of flourish, he talks about the sort of very specific economic understanding of, of inequality in terms of wealth or income mostly. But um, so as I understand it, you're, you're sort of looking for this or an understanding or new understanding of inequality in text, but the, 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 the authors themselves don't necessarily use the expression of inequality. Is that the case or am I mis misunderstanding your, your project? Thank you. Thank you for for that question. It's a very it's a very good question, and also something that that points to how uh, my project has also changed. As Gerardo would know, I think I've mentioned that for you a couple of times. Um, I, so I am part of a larger research project where we are um, investigating the intellectual history of global inequality in four different countries. Um, and from the beginning, we were interested in looking at the concept of global inequality. What became um, obvious quite quickly was that this concept was very difficult to find in our material. Um, and so, so what I then did uh, broadly in my, my project was to instead look up for these vocabularies of inequality. So uh, you're very right, not specifically looking for that word being used, inequality or global inequality, but looking for these descriptions of some unequal con uh, conditions or relationships in the different material. Um, and, and here then specifically looking at uh, inequality in general, but also still interested in the, the idea of an unequal world. That is the dimension, the more global dimension uh, that I'm especially interested in. Um, so yeah, it is not uh, looking specifically for when and how is that specific word used, uh, but in a more uh, abstract sense or how, yeah, how are, um, again, I think that's why I'm saying ideas of inequality, right? How are, uh, yeah, I hope that that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Maxima, I, I see your point. I think you're raising a very interesting uh, discussion as to what does it mean to do to do conceptual history beyond following a concept and the change of meaning that it gets attached. And obviously, if there is a critique in your question, it's kind of the arbitrary nature of how we draw the semantic spheres around the concept, right? That's why, uh, yeah, we should really talk about that. that, that that's, a, that's, a, that's a great issue. Anyway, I think, so, I think Ross is, is next. Please, Ross. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting session, all of you. I uh, really enjoyed being part of it. I wanted to participate in this session, especially because um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved in organizing a History of Economic Thought conference, and there were several pa uh, papers presented which would have been welcome in this session, and uh, which uh, one of my colleagues, um, refused to allow because it wasn't history of economic thought. Um, and um, so I wanted to um, make sure that I participated in a session which challenged the notion of what constitutes economic thought uh, as a historian. Uh, I have a close friend who's a philosopher of African um, uh, ideas and traditions uh, has long been a part of the conversations that some of you are part of. And uh, so I, I, I'm very happy to, uh, to encourage this. I don't have a specific comment about any of the ideas because the whole idea was to sort of say, go, let's keep doing this. Let's interact with these ideas uh, across the world, not just in uh, the context of African uh, uh, philosophy uh, and, and thinking. So uh, I, I really appreciated the presentations. Look forward to hearing more uh, like this. Thank you, Ross. That's very kind of you. Beatrice. Hi. Uh, OK, so it's a very naive set of comments. I'm very new to that 
uh, to that sort of like historiographical questions. And so I'm not going to try to look smarter than I am. So basically, there is a, a sort of shock for me because I, I came to the session thinking what you're going to do is basically saying uh, that what, what Gerardo says at the beginning, I and mean, we look at this history through the prism of development economics. And one, one outgrowth of this is basically to project a set of concepts that is being framed and US, UK, France, whatever onto this stuff. And so I, I, I sort of expected uh, the discussion of more I mean, indigenous concepts and what, whatever, and that's not what all three of you are actually doing. What you're saying is basically that what is being challenged is the historical dynamics. And in particular, the break, as David says, like there is a pre-colonial era, a colonial era and a post-colonial era. And, and all three of you suggest that you wanna uh, like challenge this to some extent. But uh, so I, I wanna ask for the question about how these historical dynamics and the concepts themselves match or don't match. So, my, my, so I, I got basically the same kind of question for all of you. Uh, so for instance, Gerardo, you basically challenge the notion that, that some thinkers can be free market advocates. But throughout the talk, I was like, so how does that notion of market uh, shows up in, in Ghanaian history? I mean, is it imported? Uh, is there a different type of thoughts about market to begin with or whatever? And, and the related question was an interesting feature of your, an interesting conclusion that there is no notions of, of poor uh, of unequal, yes, but poor not. And so my question was that uh, as there is this sort of like interbreedings of, of, of concepts and histories and fights, uh, does the poor shows up some, uh, at some point uh, in the history of inequality in Ghana? Uh, I, I've got the same question uh, uh, for David relating to, 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 to exp exploitation and, 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 and the history of mining and and I, I was wondering whether, um, I, so, so you say there is basically more continuous history of this kind of facts and the relationships of minors to, uh, to others uh, and, and what's, what's typically Ghanaian versus what change and what can go global at some point. I was also wondering whether there was a specific tie to understanding nature uh, or, uh, or land uh, or not. Uh, and Melanie, I got the same question with bourgeoisie, basically. So you uh, say the, this is a notion that is drawn from Fanon quite largely. And what I found interesting, so I had the same kind of questions. Does it acquire a specific Ghanaian meaning uh, or, or not? And I also, my sense by listening to you was that sort of like the slavery issue wiped, I, I hesitated between two theses. Either it wiped out, the previous conceptual way of making sense of hierarchies in Ghana, or it created a way to uh, think about this issue why there were not previously issues. And I also said it's curious because you, you seem to suggest that there was sort of like a global conceptual response to that, that notion of cargo, but listening to you maybe it's just because that's what you're looking into into your collective project. So one question is whether notions of inequality uh, uh, by this kind of scholar have the property of being very early uh, global, I mean, like considering global inequality before national standards or national specifics or whatever. Uh, I know it's, it's lots of confused threads, but that's my reaction today. Well, thank you so much, Beatrice. That's that's incredibly helpful. Uh, should we take Mary's question, which is the last, and then we try to we try somehow to answer to some of the things that Beatrice said at the, at the end. So, Mary, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the session. I, I found it really interesting. Um, and I was wondering because I spent quite a lot of yesterday afternoon um, discussing African economic history with um, one of my colleagues that Gerardo knows, um, Lee Gardner and the kind of organizing space of the main drivers of the last maybe 200 years of African economic history, not history of economics, being uh, slavery, slavery, colonization, uh, independent statehoods and nationalism, and then globalization. And it did strike me listening to you all that that's such a different set of categories than the categories of history of economics of, you know, mercantilism, um, classicism, into Marxism and, and neoliberalism or liberalism or 
the free market or whatever. And I actually began to think that in some ways I could make more sense of your talks by thinking of these, of these economic history um, driving forces, not, the, the, not those necessarily the concepts which within which your thinkers were thinking or your commentators were thinking, but the, that having that as my background actually, in a sense, gave me perhaps more connection to your, to your talks and, and, and particularly it helped me with David's um, talk. So I don't know whether that fits with some of um, Beatrice's um, observations about how one makes sense of um, a set of ideas which are, a, a set of papers which are coming from such a different context than the European North American ones that we're used to. Wow. Okay. Sure. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try very briefly to just just respond to to both of that. So that I'll give you guys uh, more time. Uh, I'll try to, to to bring together these two aspects. So, I mean, Mary. Yeah. I, I think one of the one of the reasons for doing this is precisely that it shows us potentially different periodizations. Right. This is true. Whether we look in the in the micro context, whether you look at the experience of a single country, I don't know, I think again of Nigeria, for example, the difference between the Ibadan and the Zaria school of political economy, what did it mean to think about liberalism um, and Marxism? At the same time, the other thing that we can do by taking this kind of approach, and this goes back to, um, to Beatrice's uh, point, and that's also where there is perhaps one key difference between debates in history and debates as they've as they, as they happened for a long time in African philosophy. That are, many African philosophers have sought um, to reconstruct and they were driven by a notion of authenticity, right? Uh, which inevitably though in many cases it ends up being quite ahistorical. So I think what, what our case studies have done in different ways is precisely to show how in practice indigenous and non-indigenous categories are brought together, conjoined, the, the meaning withdrawn, and they perform specific political functions as speech acts, if we want to use uh, uh, Melanie's, Quentin Skinner, and Wittgenstein uh, with, uh, idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's much more that, that, that I wanted to say, Beatrice, but I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, to, to David and to, and, and to Melanie to, to take it from there. So, I don't know, David, you haven't spoken at all. You want to go first? Oh, you're muted. You're yeah, muted. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I am okay now. Thank you very much for the um, questions and comments. Um, one, one first point that I would mention in terms of um, um, a sort of what is typically continuous or what kind of continuities could we draw across board, something that looks maybe probably typically Ghanaian, is um, the, the, the limit to which um, the, for example, Marxist assumptions about classes in societies should, should, should be taken caution of any time we want to explore um, economics or economic inequality and how it's even connect with social inequality. Because for the Ghanaian context, but in particular the Asante context, we see that um, the pre-colonial situation is a, it, it's an arena where um, the social and the economy are so much or strongly intertwined and one produces the other and, and, and co-ship one another in various instances. So um, as I was trying to um, illustrate, for example, the position of, um, let's say the ordinary people, what, what is fascinating about this kind of context and it even endures up to the present is the fact that whilst you may think that this individual occupies this part of the society, in case you are associating it with, let's say, a Western political economy or a Western society, maybe a person is maybe an ordinary individual, the best maybe they could attain socially and culturally is maybe to be a noble as a result of maybe the acquired wealth. But um, the, 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 the challenge is that there are some sort of subtle um, nuances where individuals that you may think do occupy this position in society today, tomorrow you see them and 
culturally, they also occupy a different position. I remember um, one author making reference to um, somebody just meeting, uh, maybe uh, I've forgotten that, but it looks like somebody being, um, let's say, for example, a professor or an intellectual or um, a middle-class individual who had employed, let's say, um, a cleaner. Meanwhile, this cleaner, when they go back to the community, maybe the person occupies maybe the position of, let's say, royalty or a chief or something. So the following day, if that employer gets back to um, maybe a social gathering and they meet, over there, when we look at ranking, the employee, that is maybe just a, 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 a cleaner to, let's say, the chief executive officer or a professor or whatever, is now the one that would be accorded a higher position in that particular gathering and not the other way around because of the, 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 the particular shift in the social system. So over here, it, I think what I can say and even when we want to look at global trends, is that maybe the carefulness we need to take whenever we are making these analysis and assumptions. That's the very reason why I took so much care, even when I was trying to talk about moral economy, how people think and ideate ways they contest mineral wealth. It's become so difficult. And to, to, to try to disregard, let's say, some of these prominent Western concepts, but immediately you want to um, confront them you, you see them dying out anytime you try to apply them to some of these um, African um, sociocultural situations. And I couldn't correctly get what Mary meant, but if you would be able to help me with just a few um, phrases of what you meant, or maybe Gerardo could rephrase that for me, I would be grateful. Um. <sighs> Maybe let's hear Melanie, and then if there's time, because we've got only two minutes left in theory. Yeah. Is that okay? I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you later what Mary said. Sure. And thank you also for the for the questions. Um, picking up on, on your question, uh, Beatrice, on the bourgeoisie, and if I understood you correctly, you're asking if if there's a certain Ghanaian way of of using this this concept uh, by the authors. Um, I don't know if it's a certain Ghanaian way, but so far what I've seen is that the, it, it seems like uh, this um, finance work uh, seems to resonate with them in their work, at least. That what is happening at the time in, uh, in Ghana, especially with the, with the whole, um, uh, with, with Nkrumah and with his role and, and the shift that he is taking, um, that that at least they they see um, they see a relevance in using in using this term. So without they they they, I'm trying to remember if the word bourgeoisie is actually mentioned in the text. But it's clear that they're referencing uh, to finance use of that and and to the wretched of of the earth. Um, but whether it's a specific Ghanaian um, way, I don't know if I can answer that. I'll uh, yeah. Thank you. And then on your second question, but that's, I guess that'll, that'll, and I guess we're out of time, but I don't, I'm no, it's not okay. sure. Don't I... We've got one hour break. I've just checked the program. So okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I understood uh, your second question on, on slavery and connecting that to, to global aspects of inequality. Yeah, it was, I mean, your cargo. So basically wherever these thinkers come from, their response is not, their response is basically directly to point to sort of a global inequality and an inequality that circulates. That's how I understand your concept of cargo. This could have been very different. I mean, they could have emphasized like a Ghanaian identity or an African identity or whatever. So I find it striking. And, and uh, this is absolutely not how French inequality would be conceived and reconceived in the 60s, 70s and 80s, nor the US inequality whatsoever. Uh, so I was wondering whether this was because of your this the specific outlook that you mentioned in your project, looking at global inequality and in concepts, or whether it's a it's a particularity from the response to inequality and the way of seeing inequality 
from uh, from one set of, of of writers. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I I understand what you mean. Um, so they're definitely talking about different kinds of inequality and also national inequalities, um, gender inequalities. I haven't touched upon that, but I think I'll work on that as well. Um, inequalities that come across in uh, individuals interacting with each other. So there are inequalities on many different levels in these novels. Um, and you are very right. I am interested in, in their ideas of this unequal world. So that's why I go to that cargo uh, notion because I see that that is that is where they um, they address the global aspects of inequality. But there are different, definitely uh, many other levels uh, and kinds of inequalities that they uh, also touch upon in the in the novel. So that's my glasses or my view, uh, not not what uh, they they uh, only what they mention in the book books. Mary, do you want to rephrase what you said for David, or should I give it a try? I don't know. Okay, so maybe I have a quick rant. But I don't like the phrase history of economic thought yes. for two reasons. One, I'm, I'm much more interested in what economists do rather than just what they think. And it also focuses attention on the notion that somehow this economic thought is sort of floating around in the ether. <laughs> um, so, um, I, and I find that deeply disturbing. Um, partly because I work in an economic history department. And so I have the strong feeling that the way economists are observing the economy and thinking about the economy is also related to what's happening in the economy. You know, so we can, for instance, teach mercantilism and, and that sort of fits with a period in which, you know, there's a huge globalization of trade. You know, we can treat, we can teach classical economics up to Marx as part of an industrial revolution movement. Well, you know, that might work for Britain and some European countries. It's not clear how it fits with other countries' economic experience. So I'm, I'm always interested in the interaction between what's actually happening in, on the economic ground and how people are understanding it in their, you know, their economic thought, if you will, but their economic commentaries, their novels, um, which are, you know, have economic traces. So I was trying to get at what you know what, what's really and so the notion of the moral economy i think has to have that same roots on the ground right if the moral economy is built up on a european notion of a class system why should it make sense anywhere else right i mean it just sort <laughs> of so I'm, I'm kind of interested in rooting economics and i so that was my attempt to say well if if one takes an economic history long run long durée view of africa um, then an economic historian colleague of mine would say, here's the drivers, slavery, colonialism, post-colonialism, independence, and then globalization. And those are the kind of economic drivers on the that are, that are not just, they're not figments, they're, they're things making difference on the ground. So I was trying to fit some of your cases and some of your commentaries into that kind of space and you know you're quite at liberty to say you're completely wrong mary <laughs> that doesn't make sense at all to me but that's what i was trying to do um jordan does that make sense to you yes yes i yeah. get you i get you okay <laughs> yeah. thank you very much yeah so um the the issue is that so i i think that we cannot entirely disregard these um concepts uh, for example um slavery colonialism and whatever. But the, the point is that um, as much as we, we look at these um, big historical questions, there are also nuances on the ground that transcend mm. them. Yes, so as far as, for example, slavery did shape the ways in which society was ordered, for my context, like Asante, there are, there are some of these societal orderings that have their connections with slavery. They do. And so the point is that when you even meet um, an intellectual, that may be an economist, that isn't familiar with history, but rather current trends and want to study um, indigenous political economy, until they go back into these maybe historical materials, archives and earlier books, they may fail to appreciate the fact that some of these concepts that might look indigenous are not really primordial. They co-shaped one another. Mm. Somebody um, might have become a noble 
just because there was um, a sort of um, Euro-African commercial activities that birthed the way in which they were able to break from the kind of societal class or rank they found themselves to another. So over here, we, we cannot do this without at least looking at that kind of interrelationships. But um, my, my, my point is that probably just picking it and dropping it is not the way to go, but rather to look at where it could fit and where it cannot. I loosely applied Thompson's um, um, moral economy because it gives me a way to look at how people were thinking about resource wealth redistribution. But it didn't happen along the context where Thompson um, gathered or conceptualized the moral economy in Britain. Britain was a free society to some extent where there wasn't this sort of enslaving. There were ranks, of course, but it didn't, and even not ranks, but class. It didn't work the same way in my context. So at least it helps to think about how people ideated these, but not necessarily to just impute it on um, the African situation or condition. So I still believe that putting these um, ideas at par is a, is, a, is a good way to understand things, but not necessarily to raise or elevate one against the other, depending on which context we are dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Sorry, just as a closing comment, I mean, it's, it's, uh, which also goes by some of the things that uh, and I are discussing in chat. I just had a flashback because one of the very first things that Mary told me when I started my PhD was precisely this. I do not like the expression history of economic thought. And uh, I don't know, maybe maybe since, since you left, Mary, I've been hanging out with the wrong people and reading the wrong book. <laughs> I think I'm liking it more and more and more, actually. And anyway, I hope we get a chance um, to talk about this. But then, so so that's the thing, right, that, that comes up. Um, when we try to ask ourselves, what is the history of, uh, of African economic thought, right? On the one end is the concept of the economic, like literally, right? Which in many cases has nothing to do with what we understand by it, right? I think about the, the way George Agamben describes in, uh, in Reino La Gloria, this whole issue of the economy of salvation is something that has very little to do with the way we understand it with um, with uh, with economic stuff. On the other hand, we can think of uh, economic as the the domain of uh, production and consumption and distribution. Or we can go back to Polanyi's uh, two meanings of the of the economic. Uh, there is no answer. What I'm saying is that I I think perhaps part of the problem is that we've chosen too much to stick to one of these things rather than just have more fun. And certainly, African case studies are, are amazing at that. David and I are currently working on a on a project looking at the first translation of the Bible into Chi in Ghana. And that's exactly the kind of questions we're asking ourselves. How is the issue of the household economy of management translated into Chi? What are the actual words used to do that? And what gets lost and what gets acquired in the process of translation? And I mean, there's lots of ways of, uh, of doing it. But I still think calling it history of economic thought is, is a nice way to actually go beyond uh, this, uh, this uh, without losing sight of the fact that uh, thought thought can still exist somewhere, no? It doesn't because thought is detached from... Uh, anyway, I hope, Mary, Mary, I hope we'll have a chance to discuss this. You'll see. Um, yeah. Anyway, any, any other final comments or things? Or otherwise, I think, I think we, should, we should leave it there. I don't know. Maxime, you want to say something? Or? No? Okay. All right. Well, in that case, thank you all very much. This has been a great pleasure. And, uh, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Beatrice.